all societies have been shaped by the struggle to control water. From the first civilizations in the Middle East and Asia to the mega cities of our days. The future of humankind will also be shaped by the unruly element of water. In the next decades, huge water projects will radically change the face of the earth. A new uncertainty will force all societies to ask, do we live in the age of droughts or in the age of floods? We can't cope with all this water in the old fashioned way. I hope uh, God will do something <laughs> to save us. The struggle for control over water will increasingly hold the balance between peace and war and profoundly influence relations between countries and continents. What makes war start? Fights over water, changing patterns of rainfall, fights over food production, land use. This is an issue that threatens the peace and security of the whole planet. I have traveled down the great rivers, have seen water in all its forms and dimensions, and have met national leaders and water experts all over the world. For years, I've been researching and writing on the history of water. Now I invite you to join me on a global journey into the future of water. Because no one, absolutely no one, can escape the power of water. Not far from the River Seine, you can find Europe's first water bar. Guests can choose from about 100 different brands. In the last few years, fresh water has become a global status symbol. Ensuite, on a une eau, c'est la dernière venue, c'est la Sey. Elle vient de New York, en fait. Donc, elle est très, très populaire pour les, les fashion victimes, les gens qui, qui aiment la mode. Plus populaire, en fait, celle qui marche le mieux, c'est la Vos, qui vient de Norvège. Bottled water is now a billion-dollar industry, even though it costs 5,000 times the price of tap water. The bottles are transported halfway round the globe to give me and the other guests a taste of this exclusive water. The water bar affords a particularly grotesque illustration of inequalities in our world. For even the poorest of the poor need as much water each day as the richest of the rich. One billion people have to search for their water, collecting it wherever they can find it. Millions of women spend several hours every day fetching the water they need for their families. Contaminated water kills about 6,000 people every day, most of them children under the age of five. There is enough water for everyone. The question is, who should pay for it, and how much, and to whom? For the first time in history, a majority of the world's population lives in cities. In about 20 years, five billion people will live in cities and there will be 30 cities with a population of more than 10 million. Supplying these cities with the water they need will be a hugely difficult task that is sure to cause social conflicts. One place where the struggle over water has led to riots is in the Johannesburg area of South Africa. Do you want to go tomorrow, Josie? 
temperatures will peak at 23 degrees, one at 25 and 24. Just over a hundred years ago, the land where Johannesburg now sprawls was practically uninhabited. Now, over eight million people live there. For the authorities, solving the city's water problem is a top priority. Water should be on top of the agenda, the developmental agenda of all governments. And we have ensured that uh, we make it a basic human right. Hence, it is in the Constitution a basic human right. Local authorities have initiated a wide-ranging program to give running water to all the millions living in poor suburbs. South Africa is the first country in the world to declare water a human right. But this has stirred up conflict. Because in spite of this declaration, the authorities still charge people for water. This has led to riots and demonstrations. In our golden constitution, it stated that each and every South African citizen has a right to clean and sufficient water, free and clean sufficient water, but it's opposite of that coming to reality. This is at the core of the conflict a public water meter registering consumption. Water being a human right in their country, people protest when they have to pay for access to it. But every household receives 6,000 litres of water a month free. We give six kilolitres of water per month per household to all South Africans, to everybody, including the affluent. If you exceed that amount, then you start paying. 6,000 litres of water per month is insufficient because we in Soweto, we are living in extended families. Maybe we are 16 in one house. We don't want to buy water. We want water for free because water is life. <laughs> In the poorest districts, many people are demanding free water. Rich people are not having any problem. They can drink water at any time when they need. They can go to the toilet and flush the toilet whenever they need. A protest meeting is held in a Soweto school. The government's position on water is condemned as a form of apartheid. There are going to be water wars, yes, because if you don't have money, you are not going to get water, and water is life. You are going to fight to get that water, or you are going to steal water from your neighbor. So your neighbor is going to fight you in return. So that's going to create war amongst the people. This meter has been bypassed. You see? You can shake it, you can take it out at any time. People are tapping water pipes illegally and cutting connections to the water meters. And their protests have led to the authorities increasing the amount of free water they provide. Disputes over water are bound to flare up fairly frequently in huge cities. Conflicts between big private companies and public interests, and between the rich and the poor. For water supplies are going to cost more, not least as a result of new uncertainty as to how climate changes will affect water resources. The water crisis in South Africa will worsen 
because the amount of rainfall will, according to most climatologists, diminish dramatically in the next few years. Johannesburg and the area around it are lucky, however, for they can import water from a neighbor, the tiny mountain country of Lesotho. Lesotho has a population of about two million and is one of the world's poorest nations. But Lesotho has one resource in abundance, water. And its geopolitical importance lies in the fact that it is the water tower of South Africa. In 1986, before the end of apartheid in South Africa, the two countries signed an agreement for the construction of dams in Lesotho and for Lesotho to supply the Johannesburg area with water. This dam, the Katsi Dam, is the very lifeline for the city's future. So it has a vital strategic importance for South Africa. It started to supply Johannesburg with water in January 1998. A few months later, riots broke out in Lesotho a general protest against the government. One of the things the protesters condemned was the water agreement with South Africa. The government was accused of selling the country's most valuable asset on the cheap. South Africa's response was emphatic. In September 1998, Nelson Mandela's government ordered military intervention. Reports tell of 16 protesters at the Katsi Dam being killed by airstrikes. The message was clear. No one should doubt South Africa's determination to protect its water supply. With the need for water increasing, the strategic importance of countries rich in water is bound to grow. If climatic forecasts are correct and nature's distribution of water resources becomes even more unfair, it will become more common for water-rich countries to sell their surplus to water-deficient countries. And countries capable of turning off vital water supplies could wield enormous power. But if the countries lying downstream in a river basin happen to be by far the richest and most powerful, then the economic development of politically weak water tower countries could be hampered. So that these shepherds could risk becoming hostages of their own water resources. It's so dry in southwestern Spain that the landscape makes the perfect background for the filming of some of cinema's best-known westerns. The struggle for control over water will in many countries pit water-rich regions against water-deficient regions. Parts of northern Spain have an abundance of water. Spain has 1,800 rivers, and its modernization has been closely tied to their utilization. In the future, the control of and distribution of the country's water will exacerbate other deep-seated regional differences and conflicts. As prosperity increases in southern Spain, so its need for water grows. Artificial watering has made substantial exports of fruit and vegetables to the rest of Europe possible. Moreover, 
Southern Spain is Europe's holiday playground. But is there enough water for all this? This is what the river that runs into Alicante looks like. And this is the river Vialopo, one of southern Spain's rivers which, in the years to come, must provide water for agriculture and for a growing tourist industry. Groundwater is being depleted fast. It's been discovered that water is being pumped up from one and a half million illegal wells without the government being able to stop it. Regional governments use aeroplanes to monitor water consumption in neighboring regions. Climatologists expect the Sahara Desert to leap over the Mediterranean Sea and convert a third of Spain to desert by 2050. Each year is drier, drier, drier. If nobody help us, we will come to be a desert, full desert. And uh, you know, politics are taking day by day, year and year, and nobody gets a solution. Southwestern Spain's main demand has been for the Madrid government to ensure that they get more of northern Spain's water. This river, the Ebro, is at the core of the dispute. It's Spain's largest river and flows through northern Spain. In the south, they believe that water from the Ebro can solve their water crisis. The most important component in the comprehensive national water plan drawn up in the 1990s was the Ebro Diversion Project. It envisaged tunnels and canals supplying water from the Ebro to southwestern Spain. But the plan provoked some of the largest demonstrations in recent Spanish history. Las bases del Ebro fue impuesto como una solución desde arriba sin consultar a las regiones afectadas y por tanto era lógico una reacción social. Las personas que se manifestaron lo que querían era garantizar dos cosas. El desarrollo económico y social futuro de todo el Valle del Ebro y la segunda, la participación y la capacidad de decidir en aquellos temas que afectan a todo el mundo. Demonstrators objected to their Ebro irrigating vegetables and golf courses further south. But the then Prime Minister José María Aznar ignored the protests and gave the go-ahead for construction work in 2004. But Aznar lost the next general election. The new government, on its first day in power, threw out the plan. Their strategy for solving this huge national problem was more intensive water conservation and desalination projects. Representatives for the regional governments in the south see this as a surrender to the interests of the water-rich regions. The new plans will not give enough water, they say, and will be too expensive. People living on the northwestern coast of Spain can celebrate that they have water and plenty of it. But even here, they cannot take water for granted. This annual water festival started when local people walked through the street to pray for rain after a long period of drought. Spain's water-deprived regions will demand more resolute action from the central government. People in the south still maintain that as Spaniards, they have as strong a right to the country's water as people in the north. While water-rich regions, on the other hand, will demand more autonomy from Madrid if the central government adopts a policy of compulsory water redistribution. In the future, 
More and more countries will experience internal conflicts over water rights. Increasing demand for water and changes in precipitation patterns makes this inevitable. Disputes over water are also disputes between countries. We are traveling up the Nile, the world's longest river flowing through 10 countries and three climatic zones. In 2050, about 690 million people will live in the Nile River Basin. Water demand will increase everywhere and the total need will exceed the river's supply. The shallow lakes that comprise the source of the Nile are moreover highly vulnerable to climatic change. In 1959, the two neighbors, Egypt and Sudan, signed a treaty by which they share all the water in the river. The problem is that the Nile flows through eight other countries before it even reaches Sudan and Egypt. For different reasons, none of these countries have as yet really utilized the river. This is about to change. They now have both the desire and the means to take water from the river. Few countries are as dependent on one resource as is Egypt on the Nile. Nearly all the country's 70 million inhabitants, a figure expected to reach 150 millions in a few decades, live along the banks of the river. Extensive use of the river for thousands of years has made Egypt a regional superpower. The country's future is totally dependent on the allocated two-thirds of the Nile waters. This dependency is increasing with Nile water being pumped into the Sahara to alleviate pressure on the old Nile Valley. This project alone aims at creating communities for millions of people in the desert. Some of the Nile Basin countries have asked the questions, from where are you going to get the water for this uh, big project? And we have to, uh, to work on this and to convince uh, our uh, neighbors that uh, we are not using more water than what we are using right now. We are uh, using it much more efficiently. We realize the, uh, the needs of the Nile Basin countries. Uh, definitely they need water. They have not had the chance before for, uh, for, for development due to many reasons. But we should help them and they should help us toward this uh, new future. Egypt is in a vulnerable strategic position because its lifeline flows through nine countries before it reaches Egypt. Egypt's only hope lies in increased cooperation with the other Nile countries and that their conflicts of interest stop them uniting against Egypt. Sudan is the largest country in Africa, nearly three times the size of Egypt. By the 1959 treaty with Egypt, Sudan's share of the Nile water was about a third of Egypt's. But for many years, civil wars and an economy in ruins left Sudan unable to make use of its share. This is where the Blue Nile and the White Nile meet. The Blue Nile from Ethiopia and the White Nile from the heart of Africa. In the future, Sudan intends to step up its exploitation of its position in the middle of this great river basin. The discovery of large oil reserves in Sudan and greater political security make this possible.
The capital, Khartoum, is being modernized under the Islamic regime's watchful eye. Sudan's ambition is to become the granary of the Arab world. There is huge potential, over 25 million acres of cultivable land, but all desperate for water. Today, only 16% is artificially irrigated. With respect to the irrigated, we have not yet uh, exhausted all our share of the Nile water, according to the 1959 Nile Water Agreement with Egypt. There are irrigation plans that would use 10 billion more cubic meters of Nile water per year than is permitted under the existing treaty. Sudan, aided by China, is building a massive dam across the Nile just before the river flows into Egypt. Sudanese authorities see the Meroe Dam as their country's most important development project. It is going uh, to have an installed capacity of 1,250 uh, megawatt, which is a huge amount, and this will boost our industrial and agricultural development. To Egypt, it is disturbing news, especially in the long run, since the dam's capacity to hold back the flow of the Nile weakens Egypt's control of its most important resource. We are on the banks of the main tributary of the Blue Nile, Lake Tana in Ethiopia. The Timkot Festival is held every year. Thousands of people are baptized to commemorate the baptism of Jesus. As the sun rises over Ethiopia's blue gold, the priest blesses the holy water. While I watch the believers being baptized afresh, I cannot help thinking that this water needs more than a blessing if it's to avoid being a source of international conflict, even war, in the decades to come. Ethiopia is the Nile's water tower. Nearly 90% of the Nile's water originates in Ethiopia. But only 1% of Ethiopia's land is being artificially irrigated. And its enormous hydropower potential has not been exploited. The population of Ethiopia is already larger than the population of Egypt. Its 70 millions are expected to grow to 170 millions by 2050. The government will be under increasing pressure to make use of more of the Nile's water. In a significant part of our country, we have intermittent droughts. Now, if we had the resources, we could uh, uh, store the water, irrigate our land, and provide for our livelihood. Lake Tana is the most important source of the Blue Nile. The lake has lain virtually undisturbed for centuries. The full Nile waters is divided between Egypt and Sudan. And the country which generates 85% of the water in the uh, Nile at Aswan is not provided for one single liter of water. Now that obviously is not equitable, it's not sustainable. The issue is whether we can use some of this water for irrigation purposes. 
and our lawyers would say the treaty does not bar us from doing so. If and when we get the resources, we'll use it. And we are using it, although our resources are limited. We are building a few dams on the Nile Basin, uh, and we'll continue to do so. Hopefully, we'll do so with the understanding and support and cooperation of downstream countries. But in the end, it's a question of our own survival, and we will have to take care of our interests. Deep in the intractable Ethiopian mountain plateau, the Ethiopians are building a dam that will radically challenge the existing Nile regime. For thousands of years, the Atbara tributary, or the Tekesi as the Ethiopians call it, has cut deep ravines, free of any man-made interference. This is all about to change. Ethiopians, with Chinese help, are building Africa's highest dam. A concrete wall, nearly 200 meters high, is being built across this cleft. It's as high as the spot where I am standing. The dam will hold about 4 billion cubic meters of water. Technological developments of this sort are going to shuffle the cards again and again in political games where the Nile's future is at stake. This signals a change in power relations in favor of upstream countries. A momentous change. On a world scale, it will be of historic importance. Countries along the other main tributary, the White Nile, are also projecting new Nile projects. Tanzania has ignored Egyptian warnings and pumps water from Lake Victoria. And in Kenya, plans have been suggested for channeling water from rivers that feed Lake Victoria to arid land in the east of the country. The Nile Valley has suffered from civil wars in recent decades. Many people fear that disputes over utilization of the river will cause international conflicts. The situation is unsettled. On the one hand, all parties say they want cooperation and the intergovernmental apparatus for this is being erected. However, on the other hand, hydrological anarchy exists on the ground. But the Nile is just one of many dozens of river systems where an intense struggle over water rights will take place. And this will happen against a background where, according to the United Nations, one in four of the world's population is living in countries with serious water shortage, and one in two living within multi-nation river basins. There are, however, some interesting exceptions to this general picture. In Norway, there is water everywhere. Six of the world's 13 longest waterfalls are found in this North European country. And there are 3,000 river basins that are practically 100% inside Norway's borders and where water flows all year. Norway's choices can be made in a highly privileged position. Here, the water conflicts are very different. What is at stake are values and different attitudes to nature. This small country is the world's sixth largest producer of hydroelectric power. But the era of state-led hydropower development is over. 400 rivers are now protected against dam building on a large scale. This is a very unusual decision seen in an international context. 
Norway has therefore something that is fast becoming a scarce commodity in the rest of the world. Watercourses shaped by nature alone, untouched by man. However, rivers here are not protected against construction if a plant is to produce less than 10 megawatts. In a small valley close to Scandinavia's largest glacier, some of the pioneers of what can be the new era of micro-hydropower are at work. These two farmers own their own waterfall, something which would be impossible in most other countries. They're going to produce electricity for the international market. The jordbruker here is a little bit small, so they need a lot of water nearing, I can say. Tanken around the small kraftwerk was to build it out, but for the other people, they are the ones who can get the most out of this. They know they are sitting on a kind of gold mine, a sort of permanent money spinner, and all it needs is water. I hope that this is a pioneer project, so that others can get the most out of it and get the most out of it. There are many other buildings here that can be built on the same way. The Norwegian authorities consider that 4,600 mini, micro and small power stations can be built. This has given rise to a feeling of optimism in many Norwegian villages. But what will the cost be? Will the Norwegian scenery lose its special character, free-running water and cultural landscape side by side in an intricate economic and aesthetic balance? Just because small farmers want to secure their livelihood? This conflict between protection of authentic waterscapes and construction of small power stations in hitherto uncontrolled rivers has a global, cultural and social importance. When man has first altered nature's waterways, there is no way back. Asia, the struggle over who should control utilization of the big international rivers is more a struggle of life and death and will have enormous consequences for billions of people. The struggle will involve major powers like India, China and Pakistan. The rapid development taking place in this part of the world will affect rivers like the Brahmaputra, the Ganges and the Indus, rivers that have played such a vital role in the development of civilization it will boost their importance both politically and economically. India is on its way to becoming the world's fifth largest economy. And there will soon be more Indians than Chinese. Demographers expect India's population to reach one and a half billion by 2050. From all corners of society, there is a cry for more water. Indian newspapers report that farmers are driven to suicide by the shortage of water. And in one state, the state government has adopted a drastic measure to reduce water consumption. Farmers that get more than two children will not receive water for irrigation. The Indian authorities believe many regions will, in 20 years or so, suffer acute water shortages and that this will threaten India's growth, unity and stability. India's long history can be seen as an endless succession of droughts and catastrophic floods. The monsoon rains cause short-term flooding in parts of the country every year. The rest of the year, there is often a shortage of water.
In modern times, water control has been a main concern, but the Indian waterscape has not yet been subdued to the will of man. India's political leadership has recently launched the River Link Plan, the most extensive project ever envisaged. Its goal is to link all 37 rivers that flow southwards from the Himalayas into one controllable water system, and in turn, to link this to rivers in the south of the country. Using dams, pipelines and link canals, engineers will be seeking to end the monsoon's temperamental dictatorship. The authorities want to control India's unfair distribution of water resources and thereby ensure steady and regionally balanced economic growth. Such a monumental plan will meet not only huge engineering difficulties, but also political resistance. Some of the redistributed water will reach the desert state Rajasthan. Fertility, here, in this desert. The water will come from the Brahmaputra in the extreme east of India and will cross the whole of India and be led through neighboring countries, Nepal and Bhutan. But the water-rich states are, on the whole, skeptical to the plan. They need the water themselves, they say. The plan meant to unify India's rivers under central control may paradoxically split the country. Bangladesh, India's neighbour, sees the River Link plan as a national catastrophe. We still fail to understand why a friend like India could come up with a project like this. Bangladesh lies downstream from India and has no power to influence India's plans and projects. 54 of the country's rivers flow through India before they reach Bangladesh's vulnerable plain. The biggest and most important of all the rivers is the Brahmaputra. Bangladesh may protest against the River Link Plan, but the Indian authorities will listen more to the demand for more water from the one billion plus inhabitants in their own country. In Bangladesh, they say that if the river will carry less water, the ocean will take ever more of the flat plain where millions upon millions are living. We have protested and viewed our concern to India. So far, uh, we have not seen any signs that they take into account our concerns. Probably this is the order of the day all over the world today, where a big neighbor can do whatever he feels like, and India being a big power. So the other big powers are also quiet about this situation and could not care about the miseries of 140 million people. We are on the India's plain in Pakistan, an agricultural region even if it hardly ever rains there. This is the largest single area in the world with artificial irrigation. There are altogether 60,000 kilometers of canals. The source of the water is the Indus and her tributaries that Pakistan shares with India. The signing of the Indus Water Treaty of 1960 was an important factor in achieving peace between Pakistan and India. But will this treaty last? 
Pakistan's population is growing fast, and water is an ever-present issue in interstate conflicts. The Indus no longer flows into the ocean because the water is used up before it ever reaches the ocean. Pakistan needs more water, but will probably have less in the long term. To understand the role the Indus will play in relations between the two nuclear powers, India and Pakistan, we must travel north along the frontier with Kashmir. We are on our way to the source of the Indus. 90% of the water comes from glaciers, glaciers that will, many fear, melt in the coming decades. An unknown war between India and Pakistan has been waged for the last 20 years or more in these mountains, 6,000 meters above sea level. It's been called the Battle in Heaven. The two countries compete for control of the largest non-Arctic glacier in the world, the Siachen Glacier. But the glacier is by no means the only issue in the battle in heaven. This tug of war is just one example of how the water issue gets tangled up with other political issues. The Indus question is also closely bound up with the deadlocked Kashmir conflict. The government of Kashmir, under Indian control, has threatened to jettison the whole Indus agreement because they claim it makes the economic development of Kashmir impossible. It does not give them the right to utilize Indus water flowing through the region. The problem for Pakistan is that the tributary Kashmir most wants to utilize is the very river Pakistan obtained sole rights to in 1960. Pakistan must prevent Kashmir tapping this water. But will they succeed? Volatile Kashmir is a reservoir for a Pakistan desperately in need of water. Should the Indus Water Treaty break down, the future will be bleak and the battle in heaven likely to spread. However, the strategic core of the political rivalry over Asia's rivers is here in Tibet. All Asia's major rivers rise here. 90% of the water in the Tibetan rivers flows to India, Bangladesh, Nepal, and Pakistan. This is Asia's water tower. Downstream from Tibet lives one half of the world's population. The dispute over the Brahmaputra and the other rivers that plunge down from the roof of the world will decide the destiny of a continent. is China going to do with these rivers in the years ahead? The Chinese Academy of Sciences has looked at the feasibility of blasting out mountains and to channel water out of the Brahmaputra to the arid regions of northwestern China. For the countries lying downstream, this is extremely disturbing news. Even quite minor outtakes will make India's River Link plan look a risky and expensive dream. And Bangladesh's future will lie in China's hands. The Brahmaputra and the other rivers that flow out of Tibet will also seal Tibet's own political future. With Tibet holding the ultimate key to China's own water resources, a strong China will never let go of it. And what happens if the glaciers in Tibet gradually disappear? 
The most probable outcome is that downstream countries, as the water issue becomes more contentious, will be forced to play second fiddle to China, the most important water lord on this continent. The question is, in Asia and other parts of the world, will power over water bring with it political power? Will the water lords be the undisputed political masters? It's natural to end our journey on this bridge in Tibet, nearly 4,000 meters above sea level. The future of this river typifies the future of water in general. The huge but uncertain consequences of global changes in climate and the increasingly fateful struggle to gain control over water.